But now, NATO has confirmed it's monitoring the situation after a Russian missile entered Polish airspace on its way to a target in Ukraine. It's part of the heaviest air attack on Ukraine since the war began. At least 18 civilians have died, 75 have been injured after Russian missiles struck targets across the country, including a school and a maternity hospital. Vladimir Putin's forces launched a wave of hypersonic, ballistic and cruise missiles, as well as kamikaze drones at cities across the country, including Kyiv, Kharkiv, Lviv, Dnipro and Odessa. The attack is believed to be in retaliation for the sinking of a Russian warship off the coast of Crimea. Joining us now to discuss the latest developments in the conflict is Patrick Berry, lecturer at Bath University and former British Army captain. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this afternoon here on Talk TV. Uh, is this an escalation that we expect to see continue or an escalation that's simply in short-term retaliation? Good afternoon, Max. Thanks for having us on. Uh, I think that is the million-dollar question, essentially. Russia has usually had to stockpile over a period of time enough especially of its uh, hypersonic missiles and the iskanders the more capable and fast ones uh to be able to overwhelm ukrainian air defense clearly they've done this has been a fallow period over the last few months and limited number of attacks uh and then they've managed to by targeting different cities so where there's a lower air defense bubble over them uh, spread the Ukrainians, make them uh, choose about which targets they engage first of all, which is probably actually the drones and the air-launched ballistic missiles from their bombers, which has been the usual modus operandi of attack. Uh, and then after they've engaged those, it's then where they uh, unleash the more effective and rarer Iskanders and hypersonic missiles. So the big question, of course, is whether they can do this again and again and again mm. in the coming days. But given previous uh, previous patterns, I think that's unlikely at the moment. Do we have any information which would indicate the strength and the power, if you like, of the relative forces? So we know that Ukraine uh, has been supplied with significant weapons and weaponry from the West. Whether or not that continues is up for debate. But we also know that the Russians have taken significant losses. So how can we assess as to the relative strengths and, and whether the campaign can continue, continue in its current form? Well, I think... You know, Ukraine is engaged against a bigger military with a larger population and greater resources uh, in its enemy, in Russia. And therefore, Russia's moved on to a, a, a war footing in terms of its national production. It has a smaller economy than the West, uh, combined by a factor of about 20. But because it's moved on to a war footing, it's able to increase its production, especially in artillery. And it can draw on a lot of manpower. So if it's left in the, as the way it is without this 60 billion dollars of aid coming from the us or the 50 billion euros from the eu essentially ukraine will not be able to sustain a, a conventional war and man those front lines and fight off uh russia in in the way that it has been over the last couple of years it would have to switch to an insurgency essentially uh, let's look at look at some of the places uh, that were attacked so you've got uh kiev and Lviv in the west, and then you've got various places in the south and uh, Kharkiv, of course, in the east. Kharkiv, uh, we've heard of a number of times before. But I wanted to talk about Lviv because that is actually quite far from the front line, and there are various reasons why that is being targeted, aren't there? Well, yeah, it's the, it's the most western large city in Ukraine and um, a very, I've never been, but apparently a very beautiful place as well. But it has been targeted before. It was targeted in the first year of the war, then less so in the, in the second. Uh, and there's obviously uh, in that area, um, shipments and supplies are moving around. But I think this is the, the, the message here is, look, at we, we can hit any of these cities. We intentionally are actually hitting these cities to make you spread your air defence. Uh, mm. and to keep the pressure on, the political pressure on. There is some interesting context here as well, which happened over the last couple, of, or the last week really, which was the first one, is the Ukrainians received more Patriot and NASM's batteries of air defence missiles, capable systems. And then in a few, in about a week later, they ambushed uh, three Russian, we think three Russian Su-34 bombers in the south, basically by moving those extra air defence systems out closer to the front lines. The Russians thought they were safe, they weren't, they got caught out. And then you had the air, we think, and again, an air-launched attack on the, uh, the the landing ship in Fiodisa mm. over to the east, uh, sorry, yeah, the east of Crimea. And both of those showed that actually Ukraine was having a bit of an, getting a bit of upper hand in the air defense and air capability area. So potentially the message here is you've got to protect all your cities 
because if you don't, this is what's going to happen. And therefore, the Russians will have greater freedom of maneuver their air force down and near the front lines. Now, there's no doubt that one can get war fatigue. And certainly in terms of coverage, uh, other things have been going on in the world. What happens, do you think, in 2024? Does this drag on? Do we see a peace effort? Do we have to perhaps see uh, some change in terms of the, the West's foreign policy? Tough call, yeah, and I'm not a clairvoyant. I think <laughs> you've always got to distinguish between the political factors which could influence things really quite considerably. So excusing any change in major change in politics in the West uh, and also in Russia and a no collapse of either side's forces, I think, were involved, uh, you know, in what will be a long war. Of course, this is predicated on there being continuing Western aid, which hopefully will still come. I think the real question is Ukraine needs to work out a strategy along with its allies out to about 2026. This is a long and a big war yeah, against a major world power with a large military. So it needs to work out a resource strategy out to 2026. And their big question is whether they can afford to go on the defensive with, over 2024 to build up and husband their forces, train them up and have another major go with uh, air support this time at a bigger scale to take back more of their territory, probably not all of it in 2025. I think that's what the plan needs to be. And how much of a difference does it make that it is coming up to, well, it is it, it, we are now in winter, but of course it hasn't got to that sort of, you know, really bitterly cold situation yet. But how much of a difference does that make when you've got uh, two powers who, who are actually used to operating in, in the freezing conditions? Yeah, they are, and, and they design their operations often around it. Uh, it has got cold in parts of Ukraine already uh, and then warmed up again. Uh, and in that period, of course, things slow down uh, often. It's just difficult to get logistics up. It's difficult to get Kazovac, um evacuating casualties out. Uh, and, and so things slow down, but they don't stop. That's generally the case. Sometimes, like the Russians have tried to as well, just take advantage of bad weather like blizzards, etc., when there's less drone coverage to launch surprise attacks. Uh, and they've been moderately successful in that, but they've also taken some heavy losses. Uh, but they are putting the pressure on an outside back moot on a town called Avdivka, where the Ukrainians may have to withdraw. But as you said, Penny, like most sides are used to this at the, and, and are aware of the constraints that fighting in winter puts on their forces and, and sort of deal with it. Uh, but, you know, to give you an idea, there's a, a basically a troop or sorry, a, a mice infestation in both sides lines. Uh, and mice and rat infestation at the moment, apparently, which causes like diseases to the troops as well. Oh, I mean, let's face it, there's nothing nice about um, wars in any way, shape or form. Thank you very much, Patrick, uh, for talking to us today.